Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kashawn Hopkins. I'm an instructional technology specialist from Oklahoma Public School Resource Center. And um, in this tech talk, I'm going to talk about distance learning environments. And so um, I am I'm really excited to jump into uh, one of these special topics. It's, it's something that I've always wanted to do uh, at the inception of uh, doing these technology talks. I always imagine kind of like one side of it would be uh, the individual tools, which I've done plenty of. Um, and I've always wanted to breach these special topics because I knew once I started to do the research and start digging in and start unpacking things, I would find more things um, to chat about and, and things that really interest me. And so I feel like um, something that is relevant, um, a good place for me to start would be distance learning environments. But before I jump in even further from that, um, I do want to yield some time. I'm joined here with my uh, with my amazing colleague. He's here with us today. Um, and I just want to give him an opportunity to introduce himself. So go ahead. Hello, I'm Kurt Bernhardt. I'm the technology director for OPSRC. And Kashan and I make up the tech team here. If you need any technology help at all, just reach out to us. We're here to help. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate it, man. Um, over here, you can reach out to us at techteam at opsrc.net. Um, that's a good way to reach both me or Kurt. Um, additionally, if you're following along in the live session, hello. Thank you, everybody who's joined us here. Um, if you do want to follow along, you just want to have access to these slides for right now. Um, I do have a link to them over here. This link is case sensitive, so I'm going to read this out uh, and we can post it in the chat. That'll be uh, lowercase t period L Y forward slash uppercase F uppercase B uppercase D and uppercase B on there. Um, additionally, if, if you're listening to the recording later, um, you can get everything, um, including the recording over here at OPSRC, OPSRC.net forward slash tech talks over there. Um, and I'll reference this a little bit later because there's actually a slide dedicated to this. Uh, you can see the upcoming tech talks, like the other special topics that I plan on doing, just like natural avenues, I think, spawn from, from uh, remote slash distance learning topic I'm doing today. We got the archive tech talks, like the technology standard stuff I've done, the, the tech integration models, which is kind of like the basis of me starting to do some special topics and going all the way to the individual um, stuff that I've done before. Um, there's tons of stuff out there, loads of resources. So please take advantage of any of the recordings or the videos or the slides that we've done on there. Um, so just to start uh, unpacking what, uh, what we're gonna try to do here, uh, like I said before, this is kind of the, the first of me jumping into these special topics on here. I'm still playing around a little bit with the format of what this is going to look like, but you know, uh, I'm not gonna figure it out until I start trying it out. So here it is. Um, for anybody to enjoy and to use um, as a resource. Uh, just as a guide here, like I do in all my other tech talks, I do have object objectives still for this one. Uh, after this tech talk, educators will be able to implement learning and design principles, best practices, and technology in a distance learning environment to support student learning. And I underlined support student learning because I'm going to jump into a bunch of stuff in here. It may feel like a lot, but don't forget uh, kind of the shining light at the end of the tunnel here. Uh, the main focus is that no matter what we're doing here, um, it's always going to be for the students good at the end of the day. Um, they're always going to be kind of the center of what we're going to try to achieve here. I even included a picture, I, like as I was preparing this, I couldn't get this image out of my mind on here. And I and I think about it. Uh, so of course it's a reference to, to Simpsons, but I think about it uh, just because of, and just to spend just a really quick moment and then I'll move on, uh, of the, the types of struggles and things that, uh, educators have had to go through, um, not just, you know, throughout their entire career, but just like the exceptional amount of things that like administrators having to make decisions or educators trying to, um, you know, just make learning possible in their classroom. Um, and just not forgetting about like what we're trying to do this for. And so I was I feel like this picture like perfectly encapsulate kind of the feelings that I have, especially going in. So it makes me really proud of the work that I'm doing here um, as being someone who supports educators at the end of the day. So I hope um, at the at the very least by the end of this, uh, this has been worth your time in terms of um, really just starting the conversation on 
uh, this topic, which is about distance learning. And I feel the same way about all the other topics that I'm gonna try to broach uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, just to give us a, a little map here, um, I have a little bit of a schedule on things that I'm going to want to touch on. Um, it's kind of going to be a broad schedule that I'm going to use for some of my, some of my other topics, but like this format on here. But I just want to answer three questions. Uh, first question is, what is distance learning environments? Uh, the second question is, how do you design a, a distance learning environment? Uh, I try to bring in multiple perspe uh, perspectives on that. And then the third one is how can we support students in a distance learning environment? So try to answer those three questions in a couple of different approaches for that. Um, to, and I try to pull together a bunch of resources and everything that I try to reference or mention on here, I put it all on the same page in my resource wrap up at the end of the slide. So if you have access to the slides, awesome. You have access to all those, those lovely little resources. Um, additionally, if, if people here in the live session, if you're, you're very welcome to, 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 to chime in, throw in some, uh, uh, some questions in the chat, or if you have any comments, if you got any, uh, uh, just anything that you want to say in there, go ahead and throw it in there. Uh, Kurt's managing the chat, and I'll try to keep an eye on it as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to take a real quick sort of water, and then we're going we're gonna to dive on in. There's lots to, to get here. Okay. So first of all, what is distance learning environment? I tried to give kind of like a broad, vague, uh, 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 loose enough definition that like, you know, it's, it's plain English, but it, it still kind of gets the point across. And on here, it's a space where learning occurs outside of the traditional classroom setting on here. I, I found is probably one of the, the best definition I could come up with at the moment. Um, some things to consider from both sides, I think. I try to do a little bit of research on the pros and cons of distance learning environments or, or doing distance learning or remote learning on here. Um, the pros to consider would be uh, uh, being ha giving students the opportunity to build their up independence. This is a, a time uh, where you're, you're really just kind of like forced to have less control um, as an educator in a way. Um, you can still monitor the students, you can lead the horse to water, so to speak, uh, but really it's, it, it's coming down to the students. And I think this is a real good um, opportunity to start empowering them. And, um, and just a little bit of a reference to um, the ISTE standards that I was talking about not too long ago. Um, yeah, this is kind of like at the center of that is just being able to empower learners and, and making sure that they have the tools um, and they're able to, to walk themselves through the process of, of educating themselves. Um, and the educators kind of like shifting here um, as, as facilitators of the knowledge instead of kind of like the, the keepers or the, or the masters of the knowledge here. Um, some more pros, uh, it, like I was kind of getting into, it's being able to just focus on the learning itself. Um, uh, there's the, the flexibility of when students are going to engage in the learning. Sometimes you might have a situation where you're doing synchronous learning, where everybody's kind of getting together over a Zoom conversation. Uh, but sometimes you might have where like students are working on projects and they have like deadlines to work on. So it just um, it, it gives you an opportunity to really um, approach education in, in kind of a different way. Um, building on that, you can learn it. Students can learn at their own pace um, and they have access to uh, a wealth of information um, as long as they have uh, like the proper hardware, they're able to have like a good connection and um, they're able to get into it. So um, so it kind of comes down to uh, more of like on the educators end, being able to curate information and on the students information, being able to find information that's good for them. Some cons to consider on here is uh, the lack of self-monitoring and study skills. If the students lack these things and if it's not intentionally taught, um, they're going to struggle, uh, and it's going to be easy for students that would typically fall behind to fall even further behind. And I, I imagine if if anybody has ever been in an online class, it's probably experienced at least a little bit of that. Um, there's less opportunities for interaction. Um, you know, the social element of being able to to, to physically see with people and work with people um, is not going to be there unless it's going to be intentionally built into that. Um, like I said, it's easy to fall behind. Uh, you could potentially run into technology issues, especially when it comes to a stable um, internet connection or it's a hardware issue, so those can run in that. And uh, kind of the lack of that physical practice, like if your content really leans on doing things like um, doing labs or doing some kind of physical activity, it's really hard to make some of those happen. And um, and I, I've seen 
I've seen educators kind of like go around this particular con in really interesting ways, in particular, like the uh, the elementary um, teachers, they've really figured out some like really unique approaches to this particular con. So one thing that I do want to share that's a little bit of a graphic on here, I got this remote learning 101. Um, and um, it's just a little bit of a graphic on giving uh, little snippets on what remote lear um, learning looks like. Like, for example, there's no one one right way to approach remote learning on here. Um, the or trying to assign a manageable workload. So like more more so than ever. And I feel like I, I mentioned this a little bit later. Um, it, being able to just highlight like what's really important. Like it feels like whenever you're looking like at all the standards and all the wonderful things that you got to teach and you got to get ready for 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 um, like testing and things like that much later, like it's it really feels like everything is important, but it's like you have to really like more so than ever, it's important to just kind of like identify the essentials here. And even down over here, uh, bottom right hand corner where it says make time for check ins. Um, like being able to make phone calls or do virtual office hours, just kind of having the opportunity to, to, to be available um, to your students, to be able to, to just have that time where they're not like actively trying to engage in this instruction, but they're more taking an opportunity to reflect back and see, okay, where am I at? Where I needed to go? What is it going to take me to get there? Type of deal. So um, I just kind of like this. I'm going to um, I think this is a good resource to reach back into just to get a more clear idea of what remote learning or distance learning could look like. Okay, so that's the first part, just kind of like putting together so we have at least a foundation to work from. Um, the next thing that I want to try to unpack is the uh, being able to design for a, um, a distance learning environment. And there's lots of ways to approach this. I tried to take in a couple of different perspectives to see if I could learn something from them um, and uh, try to think of applications. So I wanna share that here. Um, the three perspectives that I took from here are learning theories. Um, I tried to look at the best practices from universities that have already been doing dis uh, distance learning for a good long time. Um, so they have a lot to say on it. And I tried to take a look at resources that we have locally here. So the Oklahoma Department of Education. So let's take a look at a couple of those. And I wanna make sure that I'm managing the time appropriately on here. So you'll see me look over a little bit there. Uh, so yeah, and all of these, I just wanna point out on each one of these slides, I wanted to make sure that it's not just me saying a bunch of words out here. I've linked sources to um, each one of these. So if you wanna to reach to a source, uh, go a little bit deeper on any one of these, you're very welcome to. I try to link it all here. Um, so you have access to it and I'll try to make sure the slides and things are up to date. So whenever I post them, you'll get uh, everything that you need here. Um, so taking a look at learning theories and the reason why I picked um, this out, especially for me to pick it out as my first part of taking a look at how dis dis um, distance learning environments are designed is the fact that, um, and uh, the universities kind of repeat this as well, is the fact that um, no matter the way that you are teaching, no matter like the way that you're delivering the content, um, at the base of it, at the heart of learning is still those same, um, so the same ideas that you have, this, the same um, pedagogy that you, you carry with you um, as an educator. And so I wanted to reach back into those, go back to the basics here and try to pull what I can from it. So like, for example, um, and I just mentioned some of the main theories, there's so much more stuff out there. Uh, I'm barely scratching the surface at all, um, but at the very least, just kind of covering the broad topics here, um, there's behaviorism. So trying to learn uh, by forming good and useful habits. So the idea, so something that you could try to glean from, from behaviorism is the idea that um, students still need a routine in, in, in some way, like even if, um, like they already have like that built-in routine, that's like the convenience of being able to meet up inside of the classroom. Um, but they need that, like even in a distance learning environment, like they need to know, okay, where exactly I'm gonna get my content, where exactly does my uh, teacher expect me uh, to submit assignments? Um, and you have to really intentionally, explicitly teach those those uh, expectations just like you normally would in a classroom management type situation on that one. 
Um, there's more to go there, but let's move on to uh, cognitivism, which is learning by properly uh, processing new and connected meaningful knowledge. So being able to um, Really, this involves knowing the students a bit because you have to figure out like what do they know and then try to connect it to the newer information that they have on there. And sometimes this involves um, probing the students, assessing them, and sometimes this just involves doing a little bit of recall, like put adding in activities and engagements and pieces that students can do um, to, 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 to make those meaningful connections there. Um, for constructivism, uh, that would be learning by connecting socially and collaboratively. Um, for this one, uh, I feel like, and, and it kind of connects to the engagement piece that I was talking about a second ago, um, like building a space for students to be able to interact with each other. It could be a synchronous one, like a Zoom call, or you could do breakout rooms, or it could be like an asynchronous one where they are actively managing like a Google document, um, together with other students, or they're sharing a tool like they're on um, Seesaw and they're trying to put resources on, on a blog or they're building out a portfolio on um, like, like on, on a website. And so there's lots of ways to approach this, just, but just giving students an opportunity to not only connect with each other, uh, but also connect with you as well. Um, I think it goes really far to um, take just a small amount of time. Like if you're using Google Classroom or something like that, um, and personalize uh, the way that your classroom looks like throwing a bear in there, like putting a piece of yourself out there. Even something as simple as just having your face on a screen on a video is, is so much for students because they're making that connection, that human connection there. Okay. Um, next is humanism. Uh, this is by learning by supporting interest, emotion, and motivation on here. And so I know motivation, that's something that I could go for even further in, in terms of like as a special topic on that one, but just being able to um, really see students in a way um, where you, you, you know them well enough to kind of see like, like just being able to like do things like check in on them and saying like, hey, how are you doing? Or let's let's do like a, a mood check here. And I think something like that could work even with the small students all the way up to the big students as well. Just being able to have them uh, actively practice and go back and check in with their emotions. And then connectivism, which is learned by finding or sourcing updated and accurate information across networks using technology. And so I think uh, uh, this piece kind of speaks to um, leveraging, te leveraging technology and using it to um, enhance or transform what you're trying to do in the classroom. Because we're since we're in that kind of unique position where we are approaching um, distance learning, we are seeing that as um, a way that students can learn uh, in, in like a K through 12 type setting. Um, I think this is uh, a nice little piece on there on being able to, to leverage uh, not only like a community of learners that you can build with students, but also the information that they have access to. Okay, I'm gonna have to do a little bit of adjusting. <laughs> I know I've spent, I, I could spend all day on some of this stuff, um, but let me touch on a few things that I have here. Um, designed from universities. So I tried to look at a couple of different ones. Um, the two main ones that I got, I pulled resources from would be Harvard and Stanford on here. I'm gonna to touch on the Harvard pieces here, uh, but I'll save Stanford for maybe another time. Uh, on here, just a couple of, uh, of quotes from them that I think are going to be really useful to consider would be uh, uh, something that I had mentioned already. Uh, the basis of teaching is the same for every modality. So keep, keep those good, uh, those best practices in mind, like doing things like making sure that students are appropriately challenged or being able to chunk material into smaller pieces on there. Like those things helped in uh, 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 um, in a physical setting. It could also help in the, the distance learning type setting because students are still learning um, at the base of it. Um, yeah, over here, I have look for opportunities for students to engage with you and each other. And so try to intentionally build out um, the space for students to be able to work with each other um, and have those conversations and build some of that out. 
Um, moreover, I did want to add on here, uh, they did specifically mention long lectures support passive learning are not as effective on that one. I know the temptation is to do what you've been doing before. And if this is one of those things, maybe consider alternative approaches um, or uh, ways to get technology to support this. Like if you do wanna do a long lecture, maybe do the long lecture, but like break it up into nice little bite-sized chunks for students to be able to review um, and then have like maybe an action piece, like a piece of engagement that's set to each one of them. And I'm going to skip it down to this last one down over here in technology, uh, less is more. Um, and so uh, just to expand on that, just being able to build your confidence with a few couple of tools on there. Um, because I know if you're trying to introduce a tool, uh, a new technology tool in the classroom, it's just like having like a person randomly show up in your classroom, like students are going to like get distracted and like, okay, what's that? We got to, we got to figure this out. Um, and um, it's, it's going to be a little bit of growing pains on there. Um, but uh, as you get, as you kind of push through some of those, like, like the anxiety that comes with that and just um, trying to reinforce um, uh, those procedures and just kind of like building onto that and even having students build, um, push through a little bit of that anxiety together with you, um, it's gonna build that confidence. That way you can lay the foundation um, for even greater things in the future. Okay, um, yeah. I'm gonna skip that slide over there and I'm gonna to go towards a design from the Oklahoma De um, Department of Education. I wanted to look at local resources as well. Um, so like, for example, and I wish I could have put more on here. Um, I really could have like, just like copy pasted some sections on there, but I picked three things that kind of stood out to me. Um, so this comes from the, um, the teacher section uh, from the Oklahoma Resources for Distance Learning. Um, one section was high level planning. And so uh, the idea behind identifying essential outcomes, needs and competencies. Um, so um, something that I had mentioned before is really being able to identify uh, what's important there. And this isn't something that, you know, one person can really figure out. It's something that you'll have to negotiate um, with your colleagues on this one and negotiate with, with, ex with other subject matter experts on this and trying to figure out, okay, you know, uh, if we don't have the time for this, if we're trying to give students the space for them to work, like what is the thing that they're really going to need? Like what's the thing that um, really connects and pulls everything together on this? Um, the next thing on here is student instruction supports interaction. That's probably the biggest section that I was like, I wish I could just copy paste this and then dump it into people's brains. Uh, but one of the biggest things here, I think, is to be patient as students uh, work online. Um, and I know that's a real struggle. Like you, you like I know, uh, uh, like you want to give out those deadlines. You want students to have everything out all the time. But I know in a, in a practical, realistic setting, it's going to be hard for students. Like they have to deal with whatever they're dealing with on their end in the distance learning situation on here. So just having that little intentional uh, uh, that 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 in, in, in like almost seemingly infinite uh, uh, capacity for, for patients on there. Like you definitely don't wanna just like never have them turn anything in ever, but just like, you know, giving students kind of the benefit of doubt on this. Um, and then finally, technology and online instructions, just being able to monitor student morale and workload. So something that I've been harping on once again, and I know it's gonna come up a little bit later too, is uh, being able to check in with your students and see how they're doing and making sure um, you have that intentional space over there. Okay, one last thing over here. Um, I might go a little bit long on this one, uh, but it should be all right. <laughs> uh, if, if anybody's still here with me, I really do appreciate you, you sticking in. Hopefully something has speaks to you and, and gets that conversation going. Um, and at least maybe even lets you consider something that you've never considered before um, as far as distance learning. Uh, and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this and we'll try to broach the topic again. Um, but at least for right now, I wanna move on to my next section, which is ways to support students in distance learning environments. Um, there's three ways, uh, three perspectives that I wanted to take a look at, which is universal design of learning, uh, technology, and social emotional learning on here. And so real brief uh, little bits of this on here um, for a universal um, design for learning. Uh, the broad idea on this one and uh, the Center for Applied Special Technology, they're the ones that are kind of like, they put out the official guidelines out there. Um, but the big idea on this is designing curriculum with the intention to meet the diverse needs of students. 
Um, that's something. And, and if that's like, yeah, no duh, but it's, it's, I know it's kind of hard in practice, especially when you're trying to make plans and just try to make things happen and, and try to pick out the right tools for the right job on here. Um, and a, a part of that is really just knowing your students as well and what they need. Um, but uh, there are other things that you can try to take a look at here. Um, the three big ideas for, uh, for UDL would be to anticipate um, barriers by providing multiple means of, and then they try to jump into three different topics. And, and this is something that I feel like could be a good special topic for a little bit later is to unpack all of this. Um, but, for, um, but for engagement, um, I'm looking for things like interest, um, effort, uh, self-regulation. So um, being able to take advantage of, uh, you know, what makes students unique and taking a look at whatever uh, things that they're interested in and what they'd like to pursue. And so that could open the door for like inquiry-based um, instruction or, or having them, giving them opportunity to, to make projects and do project-based instructions on that one. Uh, but just having them being able to set their, doing simple things like set their own goals uh, and then finding checkpoints within those goals and then kind of working from there. Um, you wanna make sure that you provide multiple means of representation. So try to really um, like bring in visual design. Um, I, I know I put in a lot of like text and things on here, but just making sure that a lot of that stuff is consistent and you're not just using just text, you try to bring in videos or sound, there's lots of different ways that you can approach and really try to highlight um, vocabulary, like regardless what subject that you're in, um, there's always gonna be kind of like a language that's attached to your, your content there. Um, and so it would be good to, to nail on that and, and make sure that students have a shared understanding before they move on to the other topics. So I would say that's probably like a good place to look in terms of, of critical content. And then finally, action and expression on here, just give, opening the opportunity for you to give feedback to students and support them in a lot of different ways and giving them a space to be able to respond to you. Like, don't just be the only voice that's there. Okay, um, a piece of technology. I know there's loads of tools out there, um, but like I harp on, uh, in all of my tech talks, and I've already said it already, and in a good chunk of my tech talk, you want to make sure that you're trying to find the right tool for the right job. Um, combining some advice from what I said before, less is more. So I tried to like really boil it down to like, what do you just need like on, on the surface level? So things like a learning management system, very much like, like Schoolology or Google Classroom, um, uh, can Canvas, just whatever uh, uh, fits the needs of your students. Uh, as the best, as is the learning management system, um, a, a way to interact. So things like uh, doing a Zoom call or taking advantage of discussion boards, uh, a way to, for curating content. And so this could be like a YouTube playlist filled with videos, or this could be like a wakelet um, that's filled with a bunch of resources from, from websites. So just being able to pull from, from something like like caught your con academies or from museums and being able to pull together content um, that's that's specific to whatever subject that you happen to be teaching. Um, I think you need a, a good way to create content. I mean, I've already talked about things like Screencastify on here or Flipgrid, uh, being able to build portfolios through uh, like things like Seesaw. And so just having a, a consistent tool that you can reach back out to um, and kind of create your own stuff and use and individualize for your students. And finally, a way to collaborate. So taking advantage of tools like, you know, the Google Suite is filled with basically everything in there is, is about collaborating um, in there, I think would be some, some decent tools to use. And a little bit of a plug, uh, I had to do it. You know, we've done a lot of technology talks about these exact things. Um, I tried to organize these based off a of topic. I did it very intentionally, um, just in case, you know, I would have to do something like this one. And so if you're interested in any one of these kind of like purpose, pur like these specific purposes, there's a bunch of tools like that. And so I already have the link down there if you want to take advantage of uh, the Tech Talk link that's down there. Okay, 
we're nearly done, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, uh, uh, everyone, for, for joining me here. I really appreciate, um, at the very least, getting the conversation started on distance learning environments, and I'm hoping to, 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 to breach it on it again. Uh, one last thing, um, very last but certainly not least, would be supporting students through social emotional learning. Um, I think this image pretty much sums it up. I'm, I'm happy that I found this, so I'm not giving you some more text on here. Um, and if you want to know more, of course, the link is down there. Uh, but the, uh, the, the castle will. Um, that, that Castle's put out uh, for social emotional learning is the idea that there's these five components, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, responsible decision-making and relationship skills. And so all five of those things are core components to um, really helping students um, like, you know, uh, process through everything that we're going through, everything that we're, we're trying to get through and, and have them come out at the end of it, um, you know, they have more of the capacity to engage with the learning, like if all of their so, if their social emotional needs are being met. And this isn't just managed by a single person. You can see that there's these other concentric circles, like the classrooms, the schools, the family caregivers, the communities. This is really a group effort to make this happen, even just for one student. And it'll take a village for this. And so um, that's real surface level stuff, but I think that's a good place to start for that. Okay, uh, thank you everybody for joining. Um, the last couple of slides are dedicated to resource. Anything that I've talked about, I put it, I try to put it on here. I even throw in a few extras in there. Um, and so if you are interested in some remote plus distance learning resources based off of anything that I've chatted about, I think those are all good starts because a good chunk of them lead to other resources as well. And if you find some goodies, um, please, 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 please share it with me because I would love to share it with other educators as well. Um, my next page is dedicated to technology integration. Um, I try to put this in part of all of my tech talks on here, even though it wasn't a good a main focus like it normally is for my other tech talks, I still like to have it on here. Um, and then my last page over here, thank you so much. Um, I have a link to the evaluation. Let me know how I'm doing uh, in particular on this particular tech talk as well, because I know I'm kind of still playing around with the format of this and how it's going to run. If it was useful, great. If it was not, let me know as well, because you know I always wanna to try to make things better. Uh, just as a reminder, hi, I've been Kishan Hopkins. Um, I'm joined here with Kurt Bernhardt. Thank you so much, Kurt, for listening to me for another one of these Tech Talks, appreciate it, man. Um, I have our email here. So if you wanna just have a chat, you wanna share resources, if you wanna know more about anything I've talked about, techteam at opsrc.net. Um, and of course, I have our Tech Talks page on here as well. And there's the social media buttons at the bottom. We would love to hear from you. Um, but at the very least for this topic, um, thank you. Uh, truly thank you for, for listening to me on this one. And uh, have a great day.